And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords. Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. Happy Parents' Day. Happy Parents' Day, indeed.、Uh, did you send a message to your parents abroad? <laughs> No, my mother's in Korea actually, so、Poor、I'm meeting、nice. her today. Wonderful. Yes, and uh, and uh, yes, I will be sending something to my father. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Parents' Day! Not to put you on the spot, it was just、uh, yeah. a casual Parents' Day observant sort of a reminder. All of our listeners, hope you guys are having good starts too. Okay, let's get started. We have many headlines to cover, starting with our first pick of the day. Civil Affairs Secretary. So, President Yoon has appointed a former Vice Justice,、uh, Justice Minister Kim j o o n as a Senior Secretary of Civil Affairs, reinstating the very position Yoon himself abolished when taking office two years ago. It does seem to highlight a different set of priorities for President Yoon for the next three years. That's right. So, Kim is a former prosecutor who served as Vice Justice Minister in 2015 until Tuesday. He was actually employed at the law firm Kim and Chang. Now, the revival of the senior presidential secretary immediately prompted speculation that Yoon's office might use the new position to deal with legal issues potentially involving him and his family. Now, that's because the position traditionally has had the power. To control Korea's prosecution, or that's what the opposition、uh, is claiming anyway. Now, the prosecution on the same day said the ongoing investigation into the First Lady's、uh, so called handbag scandal would be conducted based solely on evidence and legal principles. Now, in response to the speculation, Yoon told reporters in his office that the absence of the position had prevented the top office from properly collecting public opinion, stressing that the decision was for the sake of the Korean people, especially in light of the ruling. Party's defeat in April's general election. Now, he added that the accusations against himself and his family members will be dealt with by himself, not the new presidential aide. So, therefore, eyes are on whether the president will talk about this controversy surrounding his wife in tomorrow's press conference. Now, under Kim's civil affairs office, Ewan Moore, former presidential secretary for personal affairs,、um, personnel affairs rather, was reportedly tapped to become the secretary for. Civil service discipline dedicated to discipline inspection of high ranking officials. e d o n w a l k the former Interior Ministry spokesperson, was named as the new Secretary for Civil Affairs, who will be tasked with collecting、uh, popular opinion or public opinion as well. So there's a、mm. lot of question marks surrounding the kind of reinstatement of the position of Civil Affairs Secretary.、Um, mm. The opposition says it's because you want to. Control the prosecution,、uh, but he says it's to gauge public sentiment better.、Right. Uh, so, conflicting opinions on that. But there is also criticism that Yoon is again、uh, nominating another former prosecutor, something that he's been often criticized for,、um, basically being a bit favorable to his, you know. Former colleagues and also his university alumni as well. So,、hmm. whether that will have a certain political backlash remains to be seen.、Mm. All right, we'll wait and see. Let's move on to our second keyword of the day Capital reshoring. So, the government is also actively considering incentives for what is known as capital reshoring for so called U turn businesses. Can you tell us the details, maybe? By first explaining capital reshoring. <laughs> <laughs> right. Lot, there was a lot of jargon there <laughs> in the first sentence. I will go through them. Now, capital reshoring、uh, basically involves Korean companies transferring profits earned by their overseas branches back to Korea. The government is considering expanding the definition of U turn businesses as well to include.、Um, uh, to include Uh, companies that invest funds brought in through capital reshoring. Traditionally, they are companies that kind of you know, relocate their manufacturing facilities back to Korea. So they'll close up, they'll close shops、uh, overseas and open them back up、uh, domestically here in Korea.、Um, now, Trade Minister An Dok Gun is calling the move a so called U turn support strategy 2.0. Sounds like a tech product, but、uh, that's the name <laughs> of the strategy, nonetheless.、Uh, this means that companies like Samsung, Hyundai, and Kia 
could potentially benefit from the same incentives provided to firms relocating manufacturing facilities back to Korea from abroad. Now, the government currently offers up to 30 billion won in subsidies, among other incentives, to these uh, U-turn companies. The latest announcement comes amid global supply chain disruptions fueled by U.S.-China tensions, prompting the need to attract high-tech industries like semiconductors and batteries back to Korea. Now, capital reshoring has also increased significantly significantly as well, especially after corporate tax revisions last year. Mm. Moreover, the strategy update includes broadening the range of industries as well, recognized for U-turn incentives and improving the incentives offered. For instance, the retail sector has been added uh, to the list as well. The criteria for assessing product equivalence between overseas and domestic production have also been relaxed. Additionally, the support for relocating advanced industry businesses to non-capital areas in Korea has been increased as well, with mm. maximum subsidies raised from 30 billion won um, to 40 billion won. There's also additional support of up to 5 billion won for R&D costs. Now, the trade ministry also plans to facilitate the hiring of foreign specialists as well in advanced fields by issuing visas to these so-called U-turn companies as well. All right, and with that, move on to our third keyword. The medical school quota stalemate continues our third keyword of the day. Med tensions continue. So the government and the medical community are continuing their dispute regarding the existence and the credibility of minutes from meetings discussing the expansion of medical school quotas. So, of course, it seems the government has to submit the minutes, uh, of course, to the Seoul High Court. Um, and then what comes next? Because if one side said it's not trustworthy, is this completely moot? What's the latest? Yeah, so again, this is pretty much uh, similar to what we've been saying yesterday. Now, the government insists that it has the minutes from a key committee meeting where the decision was made to increase admissions by 2,000 students. It plans to uh, submit them to the Seoul High Court by Friday. That's because the court had asked for these documents to make a decision uh, on the medical community's appeal against the government's plan to increase medical school spots. However, the medical community is skeptical about the authenticity of these minutes. Now, the committee in question is the so-called Health and Medical Policy Deliberation Committee. Now, the committee itself is legally required to keep minute meetings. Now, despite the government's repeated confirmations that the minutes exist, the medical community doubts their legitimacy, suggesting the possibility of them being fabricated. Now, the controversy actually started when the Korea Association of Medical Professors pointed out that the government had previously told a news outlet that no such minutes existed, only to later state in a briefing that they did indeed have them. Now, this conflicting information led to further uh, mistrust. A health ministry official refused to provide specific details about the submission date and items. Uh, additionally, the government explained that no minutes were taken for meetings of the medical issues consultative body, a bilateral committee with the Korean Medical Association due to an agreement with the KMA. So they won't be apparently um, well, they don't have minutes for that particular meeting to hand to the court. Now, mm -hmm. however, the Professors Association criticized this as a failure to comply with public record keeping responsibilities. Uh, the KMA is currently gathering petitions, meanwhile, from its members and medical students to submit to the courts, emphasizing the importance of their participation to ensure a fair judgment in the appeal process concerning the expansion of medical ex uh, admissions. So basically, the um, kind of uh, controversy stems from the government trying to submit documents or minutes from a meeting that involved a committee where the KMA wasn't involved. Right. So basically the medical community is saying, well, isn't there room for fabrication from that? Because the government is saying they don't have minutes with the meeting that they had with the KMA right. because they're saying the KMA didn't agree to it. So that's where kind of, you know, the skepticism is stemming mm. from. Mm. So is our fair representation in the very minutes that's being uh, put to a test uh, by Seoul High Court as evidence to prove, mm. well, whether these medical school admissions quota hike is warranted or not. We'll wait and see, but it does really feel like an extended more of the same. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our economy section, our fourth keyword of the day. 
Vegetable inflation. So the agriculture ministry predicts that although the wholesale prices of key vegetables, including cabbage and green onions, are currently higher than last year, they will return to normal levels next month as the supply increases. But how high for now seems to be a question and a large burden on consumers out there. That's right. So according to the ministry, vegetable prices uh, spiked last month, mainly due to decreased production caused by bad weather in uh, February and March and reduced cultivation areas and lower quality uh, of produce as well. Basically, if a produce is too low in quality, then uh, basically retailers and farmers can't sell them. Mm. So hence, there's a fewer supply, and that's, which, of course, leads to higher prices. Now, for instance, the wholesale price of cabbage was 6,448.1 per head in the middle of last month. That was a whopping 189% higher than the same period last year. Now, though the price dropped to just under 6,001 early this month, it is still 115% higher uh, than last year. The ministry expects that prices will remain high until cabbages are harvested next month, considering the poor uh, crop conditions in some regions. Mm. Lettuce prices also rose by 88.6% to 5,295 one per head in the middle of last month. But it did decrease to 4,670 odd one early this month. However, prices are still 40% higher than they were last year at this time. Now, the price of radishes also increased by 4% last month compared to last year. That was due to decreased cultivation areas and lower quality. However, prices are expected to normalize after the middle of next month as more crops from places like Kuchang in North Jolla province start to be shipped. Mm. Carrot prices were about 25% higher last month compared to the same month last year, driven by a significant reduction in storage volumes and a 2% reduction in the area cultivated for uh, spring carrots compounded by poor growing conditions. But carrot prices are likely to stay high until the summer harvest begins. Green onion prices also increased by 17.6% last month. That was due to frequent rains and low temperatures in February uh, and March. Now, prices are expected to stabilize towards the end of this month as spring onions start to enter the market in greater quantities. Now, for garlic, despite wholesale prices being just under 3% lower than the average last month uh, due to high stocks from the 2023 harvest, a reduction in cultivation area for that as well and poor crop conditions this year are expected to lead to mm. decreased production so yes of course um this all means that there for the time being anyway prices will remain high mm. uh, the government is projecting that the uh, next month is when we'll start seeing uh, normalized levels, but we'll have to see. All right, so waiting on more shipments for prices to drop for vegetables for now. What are my options, Adam? Apparently, imported fruits are a little bit more affordable. Yeah, I mean, everything's just getting expensive fruits, vegetables, mm. groceries in general. So, yeah, no light uh, at the end of the tunnel for now and it seems to be a very long tunnel at that so hmm. happy parents day to us right okay yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> all right let's move on to our final key word uh vladimir putin had a pretty elaborate inauguration officially launching his fifth six-year term this is our final key word of the day putin inauguration so Korean ambassador to Russia, Ido Un, has attended the inauguration ceremony of Vladimir Putin. The Russian president began his fifth term on Tuesday. Now, E's attendance comes despite many Western countries boycotting the very event. What's the latest? Right. So, uh, not uh, yeah, EU nations were also a bit divided as well over sending delegations to the inauguration. There were some who did go uh, and there were some who didn't. Now, the decision for the Korean embassy to participate was made after apparent careful consideration, previously stating that attendance was under uh, review. Now, the government also reportedly took into account its responsibility to protect the rights and interests of Korean nationals and uh, businesses uh, in Russia. A foreign ministry official says it's still reviewing whether to send a presidential letter to Putin uh, for his re-election victory. Now, the Kremlin, viewing the inauguration as a domestic event, did not invite foreign leaders but invited all diplomatic heads uh, stationed in Russia from various countries. Now, these include nations that Moscow classified as unfriendly after the onset of military actions in Ukraine, 
Interestingly, South Korea is actually included in that list of unfriendly nations. Now, bilateral ties between Seoul and Moscow have, of course, chilled mm -hmm. since uh, Korea joined a US-led move to impose sanctions against Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. Now, despite incidents such as the detention of a Korean missionary on espionage charges and cancellations of Russian ballet performances in Korea, Moscow considers Seoul to be one of the friendliest among the so-called unfriendly nations. Uh, Putin mentioned in a ceremony last December, in fact, that the future cooperation between both nations depends on Seoul, indicating Moscow's kind of readiness for collaboration and improving ties. Foreign Minister Chotel here also reiterated during an annual conference of chiefs of overseas diplomatic missions last month that Korea aims to manage the Korea-Russia relationship strategically to the best of its ability, uh, despite inherent constraints due to the war um, in Ukraine. If there's one thing that Korea kind of prioritizes among uh, uh, anything else is its diplomacy and its diplomatic power when it mm. comes to the world. I mean, the Korean passport, for one, is a passport that I think is number one, a joint number one spot yeah. with the Singaporean, I think, passport where you can go visa free to as many countries as you want. And so, of course, Korea does uh, take diplomacy very seriously and it doesn't want to uh, damage too much the relationships mm. with Moscow. Of course, uh, there's, there, the ties have also been soured because of, you know, allegations of military cooperation between Russia and North Korea right. as well. Right. And of course, with Yoon, uh, the President Yoon's uh, hardline stance on North Korea, that of course is another cause for souring of relations between Seoul and Moscow. So, mm. yeah, so the attendance by Ido Hun is kind of being considered as, you know, a, sort of an olive branch, if you will. But mm. we'll have to see how much of an effect in diplomacy you will have. Thank you very much, Anna, for today's coverage. We'll see you tomorrow. Happy Parents' Day. Happy Parents' Day. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.